Oh, hello, hello, everyone. Um, welcome. My name is Teresa O'Koken, and I am the co-host of Stories from the Stage and your host this evening for Beyond the Page Book Club. Tonight, I'm going to be joined by Alyssa Cole, who is the author of When No One is Watching, this fantastic book. Um, and first, we'd like to give huge thanks uh, to Trident Booksellers and Cafe, who partnered with Beyond the Page Book Club on this event. Trident is open for dining and browsing from 8 a.m. till 9 p.m., seven days a week. And you can also visit their website and shop online 24 seven. My favorite thing to eat at Trident are the gigantic tater tots that are cheese filled, highly recommend them. I truly hope that they're still on the menu the next time that I get myself back over there for a visit. Now, before we get started with our event this evening, I wanna to explain to you a little bit about how it's going to work. You're not going to be able to see yourself on video and you won't be able to speak directly to the author during the interview, but we do want to hear from you. And the way that we can hear from you is by you checking the bottom of your screen and asking questions in the Q and A tab um, down there at the bottom of your screen and you can type in your questions there. Um, you can put in your questions at any point during my interview with Alyssa or now, I mean really truly at any time um, and I'll do my best to address them um, as and make sense of them as ad address them and in an order that makes sense throughout the event. Um, please remember you don't need to wait until any time or for anything um, for you to start asking questions. You can start right now. If you see a question in the in the Q and A that you would like to see answered, you can give it the thumbs up or like upvote it, um, and we'll do our best to answer the questions get, that get voted up to the top of the screen. Now, Zoom recently rolled out an automatic captioning feature, and we're excited to now be able to offer this so that more people in your homes can enjoy our events. Um, to turn on the closed captioning, you're going to click live transcript again um, at the bottom of your screen, um, and two transcription options are going to pop up. We recommend that you select subtitle, which will enable captioning to appear at the bottom of your screen, but the other option is for you to select full transcript, in which case a sidebar is going to open up on your screen and you'll be able to see um, in that what, what everybody is saying. Please bear in mind, of course, that closed captioning might be slightly delayed. Lastly, um, we are, we're also asking that before we start your conversation, if you um, We'll be asking before we start the conversation whether or not you have finished the book. So be on the lookout for a poll question about that um, coming up on your screen. Now I have the pleasure of introducing our author, our guest for this evening, Alyssa Cole. Alyssa Cole is a New York Times and USA Today bestselling author of romance, thrillers, and more. Her Civil War set espionage romance, An Extraordinary Union, was an American Literary Association's RUSA Best Romance for 2018, and A Princess Theory was one of the New York Times 100 Notable Books of 2018. Her debut thriller, When No One Is Watching, is a 2020 Edgar Award winner for Best Paperback Original and an Audi Award winner for Best Thriller or Suspense. When she's not working, Alyssa can usually be found uh, watching anime with her husband or wrangling their island menagerie. Please join me in welcoming author Alyssa Cole. Alyssa, thank you so much for being here this, this evening or whatever time of day it is on the <laughs> island where you live. <laughs> Thanks for having me. We're at the same time right now, I think. <laughs> oh, good, good. <laughs> I'm so delighted, and I understand that you have an excerpt that you're going to be reading from us. I understand you're going to be reading from the prologue. Is that right? Um, yes, I am right. going to read the prologue of the book, um, which is from Sydney's perspective and um, kind of gets the, the mood of the book going. Perfect. Let's get rolling with that. And folks, if you um, want to follow along, you can just open up to the prologue. Go ahead, Alyssa. History is fucking wild. Last fall, on a night when my ass was getting well acquainted with the uncomfortable guest chair in mommy's hospital room, I numbly tapped and swiped my way to an article about a place called Black America. Not the label politicians used to place our concerns into a neat box full of worries they don't have to attend to immediately or ever, but an actual tangible place, a slavery theme park that had opened in Brooklyn at the end of the 19th century. 
slavery fucking theme park. Black America, the theme park, was built as an opportunity to become familiar with plantation life for those of the North who belong to a generation to which the word slavery has but an indefinite and hazy meaning. This was like 20 years after slavery ended, mind you. I mean, I too get nostalgic when an 80s jam starts playing on the radio, but these motherfuckers really needed to reminisce about owning humans? It was the those of the North part that really annoyed me. The North does not remember. In fact, the North has a super selective fucking memory. As if slavery was something that happened down there, even though there were enslaved Africans building, planting, and harvesting in colonial Brooklyn alongside the Dutch. People bury the parts of history they don't like, pave it over like African cemeteries beneath Manhattan skyscrapers. Nothing stays buried in the city, though. Anyway, Black America. White people came to Brooklyn to tour the faithfully recreated plantation. They sang along to Negro spirituals and took refreshment as they watched Black people, free Black people, pretend to be slaves. History, wild. After I stumbled onto that article, Brooklyn history became a refuge for me. It blotted out thoughts of my failed marriage and the persistent sense of memory, sense memory of restraints chafing my wrist. It was something to focus on besides my mother's illness and the way everything was changing, everything, no matter how much I wanted the world to stop spending for just one goddamn minute. I decided to pay for one of those expensive ass historic Brooklyn Brownstone tours. I've lived in one of the beautiful old buildings for most of my life, apart from the, those few years in Seattle, but I needed a distraction and maybe an outlet for my frustrations. A Groupon discounted tour with a meeting point two blocks from the front door had been cheaper than therapy and a thousand times easier to get an appointment for. All right, and I'm going to stop there because I think that was too much. That's awesome, <laughs> Alyssa. It's so cool to hear your words in your own voice. Uh, so that's really a treat. Thank you so much for reading for us. Thank you. <laughs> um, so my first question for you is, I, I mean, I love this. Oh, first, I want to just acknowledge a little bit of background sound. I just heard the toddlers who live upstairs for me bouncing around in what I believe is a bowling alley because it's always that loud. <laughs> it's, <laughs> Um, and I can hear a little bit of background from you. We understand you're on an island and there are um, any number of species of frogs that give an orchestra around you. <laughs> All of these tiny frogs, I really have like tried not to imagine actually how many there are because one time I pulled up like just one small portion of dirt and there were so many frogs in it because that's where they live during the day i guess and i was like you know what i don't want to do the math i don't there's wanna... no need to think about that there's there's no need to think about that we don't we don't it's fine they live outside they never come inside they're never actually near you in any way yeah they do sometimes come inside i have once found a frog sitting on my foot <laughs> but they they actually are cute at least they're like this big so it wasn't, there are also toads, but that's a whole other thing. <laughs> I don't think we'll hear them. Lots of species. Well, it's an orchestra behind you. It's 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 kind of nice. It's At least it's nice for me. Um, we're going to have a poll question come up for our audience in a moment, um, asking if folks have finished the book. Um, that's just sort of helpful for us to know. Um, but as that poll is going, Alyssa, my, my first question for you is like, I have to wonder if there was like a moment or something that happened that you were like, I'm going to write a book about this. I'm going to write a book about this. And like, it sort of built into the idea that, that it was, but like, what, what happened? What, what kind of inspired you? Um, it was kind of, it was a lot of things over the years. Um, I lived in Brooklyn and right before, in several places, I lived in like various neighborhoods in Brooklyn. So I got to kind of see gentrification from several different angles. Um, like I lived in Park Slope, but like down by the highway where the car dealerships are <laughs> in an illegal apartment that was just an apartment cut in half um, and didn't have a kitchen sink with, <laughs> <laughs> other it's things. Fine. This is fine. <laughs> yeah, I was like, the landlord was like, you can wash the dishes in the bathtub. And I was like, hey, that's a building violation. Sure. Uh, I got a sink eventually. Um, but so basically, I lived and then I lived in um, Crown Heights. When I first moved to Brooklyn, I lived in Crown Heights. And then I had moved to Park Slope and I lived in Williamsburg and I lived in um, 
Crown Heights again and bed And so kind of just seeing gentrification from all of these different angles over the years and also yeah. how I was able to move through these different neighborhoods and different parts of these neighborhoods. And then also seeing my family um, from like I we lived in New York when I was a kid and then we moved to Jersey and then seeing mm -hmm. how gentrification was happening there and like going mm -hmm. to visit my family. And I just remember like getting out of the path train and seeing like this huge building, like where the yeah. video store was. And I was like, this is a lot. Like, yeah, we used to be called the armpit of the nation and now it's gentrification. Um, yeah. so, so it's like just this weird thing of like places that are, you know, considered undesirable, dangerous. Um, you know not great to live and then suddenly and it's not sudden but it feels sudden you turn around and there are luxury condominiums and you know new bars and uh, yeah yeah i mean i i i as as well as probably many folks in our audience um this this evening have lived in neighborhoods where where that has happened and and admittedly you know i can own that i've contributed to that in neighborhoods as well um and it does kind of happen in this slow, fast way, you know? And um, I think that part of that is like, you kind of ignore that it's happening at first and then all of a sudden you mm -hmm. can't ignore it anymore. Exactly. And, and it seems like that's kind of what Sydney went through in the book. So um, I'm curious if you can talk about um, sort of how you see the arc of her thoughts and her progress and kind of her understanding even what's happening in her neighborhood right in front of her and then what was happening in her neighborhood in the past and and how you kind of built that um with sydney i kind of wanted her to be someone who you know she's paying attention but she also has a lot of other things going on so she's dealing with a lot um she was already dealing a lot when she got when she got back home. So for her, she has this kind of emotional thing to deal with where it's kind of a betrayal to her because she was like, okay, I went, I left and everything was terrible. I'm going to come back and everything's going to be amazing. And it's going to be just how it was before I left. Mm -hmm. And so she's really trying to cling to that idea of like, everything is the same. But like you said, eventually you can't ignore these things and it really she doesn't realize that things have been going on even before she got there that put into play everything that's happening um in her neighborhood that is are deeply tied to everything happening in the neighborhood and for her it's kind of like she's so busy dealing with the emotional aspect that she's also not seeing like exactly um what's going on but also it is that thing that drives her to make the tour that then she starts doing research and starts to discover these things about the past and these things that she never learned right. um, and was never taught and kind of how you know they seem to be happening again or yeah. uh, or tied to what is happening so i think um for her you know the emotional stuff kind of prevents her from seeing things at the beginning but it does give her the impetus to start digging into things and that eventually leads her uh, and Theo to discover what is going on in the neighborhood. Right. And I have to imagine, I mean, there was so much, I mean, the characters are doing a ton of research um, in the book, but that must have also been a lot of research for you to do unless you just are a person who happens to know all these things up just regularly. Um, so we have a question from our audience as well, from Nicole, who's asking, about those historical details that you included, could you talk about your research process? Um, she says that she would love to share an author's research process to aid her writing students. Okay, um, my research process is very unorganized. <laughs> um, so I, with this book particularly, so I kind of have like um, branching thought processes. Mm -hmm. And when I research, it goes like that as well. So I'll see something or I'll be thinking of something that I want to put in the book as well. Research was this happening during this time period. Or for example, with this book, um, looking at, you know, redlining, um, mm -hmm. where black neighborhoods were and um, things like highways being put through black neighborhoods. And I, a lot of this book is kind of a buildup of 
years of research or mm -hmm. in reading. Um, I do have other, before this book, I was primarily writing romance, so in different subgenres, but and a lot of that was um, historical romance. Mm -hmm. And usually it was set in the United States and kind of dealing with, uh, you know, focused on Black and other marginalized people in American history and kind of, um, after I finished reading the book and I read Sydney's line about making people learn history that they didn't want to was fun. I was like, okay, I don't usually feel like I like insert that kind of thing that is like definitely me into the book. But that, but that, was, that was definitely me like tweaking out like, haha. I've been, like, going back sort of Sydney talking, but actually just Alyssa. <laughs> yeah, I was like, okay. It was like during the proofreading, I was like, oh, okay, I went to Does that, that happen too. a lot that you write something and you're like, I don't even remember writing that, but I guess uh, it works. <laughs> yeah, because I have a very punishing writing schedule. So often I'm just like writing like in a fugue state and mm -hmm. then I'm like, oh, wait a minute, this is good or this is terrible and I have to write it again <laughs> and do a lot of editing. Um, but sometimes it's fun. Uh, I also have like a terrible memory when it comes to certain things. So just like, sure. Uh, sometimes when I'm reading a book, I'm like, how many more times can I read this? But there's a good moment where of like enough stuff goes down the memory hole that I'm like, oh, this this is great. It's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> really and you you said you said Alyssa, you said usually I write romance. Um, and in reading this book, I I was like, this is I mean this this is a bit of a love story, you know. There, there's a love story of Sydney and this neighborhood. There's there's that love story, and there's also a love story or at the very least, a lust story with, with Theo. Um, and it's a complicated one. You know, the relationship with um, Sydney and Theo is a complicated one. Um, oh, I'm gonna check the results from the poll before we move too much further into this. Um, and we have just 6% of people saying that if we're going to spoil something um, that we should try to give a warning. Um, but 99 out of 137 people have already read the book um, and are excited to discuss things and including discussing the ending. Yay. So, the <laughs> which is probably a thing as, as a writer that you don't get to do too much. So um, the relationship with Sydney and Theo is, is obviously a complicated one. And there, there's all of this banter back and forth. And there's a particular scene um, where Theo shows up. I think they're going to um, th the, the museum to do some research and he's wearing a Black Lives Matter t-shirt. And Sydney gives him the um, code word uh, to turn his turn his T-shirt inside out, um, and we have some question a question from Liz in our audience, kind of around that scene, um, and she's wondering what your thoughts are about when you see Black Lives Matter um, signs in lawns of predominantly white neighborhoods or, you know, even seeing seeing white folks or non-Black folks wearing BLM t-shirts. What, what kind of reaction does that stir for you? Um, so for me, I don't live in the U.S. right now, so I don't. I don't, and, you know, we've been on lockdown for a while. We do now, have so. lots of folks wondering what island you're on, if you feel like sharing. Oh, I'm in, Mar I'm in Martinique. Ah, nice. <laughs> so in the French Caribbean. Um, uh, but yeah, so my thoughts on it, I think, like, I am generally happy with any real allyship. Um, mm -hmm. For that scene in particular, um, you know, when I wrote it, it was also to tie to the later part where Theo was like, I didn't even buy this shirt. Like, I just, Kim got it in some kind of gift bag and mm. he was purposely kind of not being, he wasn't trying to be whatever, but he thought he was trying to ingratiate himself a bit to her. So yeah. I kind of wanted to show, you know, Sydney is of course embarrassed and she's like, I'm not dealing with this. But Theo also was kind of embarrassed because like it was a bit of him trying to like show off a bit or impress her that didn't mm. go over well. And he, it wasn't entirely worn for like, you know, completely 
reasons of showing allyship, even though, right. of course, down the line in the book, he shows his allyship in a, in a much more important In way. pretty real ways, yeah. Um, yeah, I, th I think what you're saying makes a lot of sense that, you know, I mean, yeah, Kim got this shirt for free or wherever, it, you know, it just kind of appeared in our house. There, it wasn't there with any thought. Um, and he didn't put it on as an ally. He put it on as a person with a crush, right? And he yeah. was like, I'm just trying to make my crush like me. And it wasn't really about what the shirt means or what those words mean. It was just like that, this person's gonna like it. Almost like how, you know, a high schooler would wear the band t-shirt of yeah. someone that their crush, the band that their crush likes, but yeah. they don't even listen to that band, you know? Exactly. And I, so for me, it was kind of, I do think, you know, there is power in symbolism, um, but also an empty gesture is an empty gesture. Yes. So um, for her, she's just like, uh, she was already like, I don't feel like dealing with this man. <laughs> he shows up totally. wearing this shirt, kind of putting her in a position because like, you know, my personal feelings on her are like, I know my life matters. I understand the movement as a whole. And of course mm -hmm. I support the movement, the rallies and stuff. The, the idea of g getting rid of systemic racism, but uh, like, I don't need anyone like particularly a white person to be like, I think your life matters. I'm like, okay, cool. I don't need to know that. We agree, do thanks. <laughs> go, go, do, go do something that shows that. Like you don't have to personally tell me about it um because now it's just weird so so for for that particular thing I was just thinking of Sydney who is already kind of like on edge with everything mm -hmm. else going on and then being like in her neighborhood um yeah. with one of the new white people who has moved to the neighborhood and like okay how can this be more embarrassing and Theo yeah. being embarrassed because he you know sees himself as helpful and he wants to be helpful and um but realizing a bit once he when he gets called out kind of understanding that he was being embarrassing right uh, <laughs> and and as opposed like you said as opposed to how he behaves as the book progresses and that he is um you know taking action that it's not just words but he's actually taking yeah. action not to say that you know everybody who has a blm sign in the front yard needs to like, <laughs> yeah, 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 go yeah. out and kill a bunch of people but you know <laughs> it, like no, no, take no. action that it that it's about action so yeah, there's and, there's so many interesting characters in in the book um i think sydney is probably a favorite for lots of people my personal favorite is mr perkins um there's a Facebook group um, in connection to this book group, Beyond the Page, and we asked a question on there recently of who folks, um, who was the favorite character of different people who are reading the book? And I'm curious if you have a favorite character from the book. Uh, my favorite character, characters as a group for uh, the daycare, <laughs> the daycare crew, mm -hmm. uh, they, we're initially just going to be in a scene and mm -hmm. um, in the first draft of the book as I was writing and I was like, oh wow yeah. I was like wait I I love them I want them I want them to go back and like something about them and I'm not like I am not the kind of writer who it's like my characters talk to me or anything like that but mm -hmm. like they come from somewhere as I'm writing them and sometimes like completely unexpectedly as mm -hmm. I'm writing particular characters I'm like oh okay yes this is actually what I need in this story and this is um this is who I can be important to the story yeah so for me they were my favorite just because um I thought they you know I, I I'm like I wrote it but <laughs> like I thought <laughs> so it's a little weird but I was like oh this is like but for me you know as reading it I was like okay this like is fun and um they I are a like fun crew are, yeah and I was like, I feel like they're, for me, it was important to kind of have them um, participating in the story as well, more than, you know, just being more than just a stop on yeah. their tour, on their uh, research tour. Yeah, and we'll, I'll give a bit of a spoiler alert here, since we're going to talk about some pretty big stuff that happens towards the end of the book. Um, so turn off your ears if you don't want to hear that, but that daycare crew really come through as the heroes um, at the end of this book. And for, for my reading, as, as I read it, I was like, 
I really love that the elders are the heroes in this book, that the elders are the ones who are like, do you think that this is the first time that this happened to us? You are wrong. This is not unprecedented. This is precedented. We know how to deal with this. We're the elders. Allow us to leave and communicate with us. We can help you. That's why we ask you questions. We're not just being nosy, you know? Um, can you talk about just the, if that was part of your thought process, that it was like elder guidance and what that means in the African-American community? Um, it was definitely that, you know, it was thinking a lot about how so often we don't know what was going on in the past because like, I don't know about your family, but in my family, like people will tell stories and then like one day you're sitting around and your grandmother or your dad is suddenly like, oh, remember that time? <laughs> and then it becomes <laughs> um, this, you know, wild story that you're like, I can't believe you never mentioned this before. Um, yeah. I, I will, you know, just for a brief digression that um, my dad was actually in Brooklyn during the blackout. Um, mm. And so that was also, you know, when they're talking about things that happened in the blackout. Um, one reason I was thinking about the blackout is because my dad came to visit me when I lived in Brooklyn. He was like, oh, this, this is mm. weird. And he was like telling me funny stories. And I was just like, wait, you were like in this wild situation and you never said anything about it until now. Uh -huh. um, but with the elders, it definitely too, also for me, like I wasn't consciously thinking about it, but I really do hate when people are like, you know, I am not my ancestors. I'm not like, mm -hmm. as in saying they're not going to put up with something. And it's like, mm -hmm. yeah, you're not because you're like sitting with your iPhone. And <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I'm not going to get into all of that. And I, under I understand the sentiment behind it. Right. And that's totally. like not meant to be disrespectful, but having done so much research for my other book um, and seeing what people went through and like, you know, and I think it's actually related because I do, you know, talking about history that we don't learn in school and we kind mm -hmm. of, when we see like black people or even like Asian people, it's kind of like, you know, with black people, we were enslaved and then like, boop, 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 some things happened. Then we were in 1965, <laughs> yeah. So, Fast forward, so there's, yeah. So there's like, people can just kind of be like, well, I guess we weren't really doing anything or fighting back or anything during yeah. the time period, which leads to the I am not man. Right. But then when you actually learn history, you learn about all of these, you know, amazing things that are happening, you know. And, and rights, so much of, also, yeah. Yeah, go, I was just going to say so much of that happens by listening to your elders and yeah. um, listening to their stories like you were talking about listening to your dad talk about the blackout. Um, I'm curious if and we have um, Shivers and Machi, sorry if I'm mispronouncing that from the audience, um, and many people from the audience also wanting to know if um, they say, um, I love Sydney, especially her wit and her humor. Um, did anyone in particular inspire her character um, or any of the other characters in the book, which I'm sure is the quintessential question for you as, as a fiction writer is like, who are the real people? Um, yeah, are there any inspirations for your characters in this book? I mean, for like Sydney and Theo, no. <laughs> They, they jump out of my head. I, I mean, I'm sure Sydney is like some iteration of my pent up anger. Um, <laughs> and for the other characters, it was kind of just like in general thinking about elders in the community, mm -hmm. like not specific people, but just the kind of interactions you can have with elders in the community and um, how important they are. So, and for me, I also, I am, uh, I live in Martinique, but I'm, I'm half West Indian, not from Martinique. So I did mm -hmm, want to show mm -hmm. kind of like the West Indian presence and in, yeah. um, in Brooklyn and yeah. um, as well as African-American and, um, you know, representing both sides of my family and uh, kind of just how you know, how all of the, this kind of melts together. And, um, but yeah, there was, there was no specific people, but kind of, I guess, just 
a vibe, a vibe of <laughs> certain elder vibe. <laughs> um, so we're going to take a break in about five minutes. I want to ask you two quick questions before the break. The first is um, Doris is saying that this book would make a great movie. Um, I completely agree. Are there any plans um, for that to happen? Um, hopefully. There, I wouldn't say there are plans yet, but there are, people are interested. So mm. hopefully it will happen. Um, well, awesome. Yeah. We all back you in that. We all back you in that. <laughs> Very excited about that possibility. Um, and I'll totally brag that I was like, oh, I did a Zoom with her. I know her. Um, so the next question, um, and I'm going to again say that we're going to talk a bit about spoilers. Um, but before we go into the break, um, I'm wondering if you can talk a bit about the ending. Um, we have Lorianne saying that um, they read the book in one weekend. I also read it in three days um, and that they couldn't put it down and that the ending is extremely surprising. Um, so I'm just wondering if you can talk about the ending, talk about what the ending means for you, talk about what your best, your favorite part about the ending is. Um, so it did take me a bit to figure out the ending because there were some things that just seemed like that I thought of and I was like, no, this is corny or <laughs> like, I don't, this, this is not what I'm going for here or, um, but like one thing that I definitely wanted was for, you know, Sydney to be a hero, a heroine, a hero. Mm -hmm. um, and to, so for me, I grew up, you know, I'm a kid of the eighties and nineties and I grew up, you know, watching that was like horror heyday and Stephen <laughs> King and um, all kinds of good horror movies. And so I was like, I want Sydney to be a final girl. Um, mm. I feel like we don't have enough black final girls. I want her to be a final girl who I want her to survive and I want her to kick people's ass and get, yeah. <laughs> get some revenge because I also was thinking of how often when things happen in the black community, it becomes like, um tales of like forgiveness and mm. like talking about like forgiveness and grace and all this stuff and I'm like yeah no, no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or this <laughs> how about no um, or revolution whichever <laughs> you know <laughs> um and so yeah I kind of really wanted I I knew I was really pushing it and honestly I was shocked when my editor was like okay uh, <laughs> I was like, okay, uh, cool. Cause I really thought she was gonna be like, what do you, you better get out of here and rewrite this. Um, <laughs> but and like, you know, I did do a lot of revision, but I, I was like, I want it to be violent because I feel mm -hmm. like these things that are happening in black communities in real life are violent. Mm -hmm. um, and I want, I don't want this to be some kind of like morality tale where forgiveness and grace um, you know, there's the whole hate drives out or hate doesn't drive out hate or whatever the mm -hmm, phrase mm -hmm. that's always misquoted. Um, and I, I, I just don't, I was like, I'm tired of reading these kinds of things or seeing this kind yeah. of perspective because it's literally always requiring only one group. Um, <laughs> to compromise, yeah. Or, it's or, not really or, a compromise yeah. when only one group is doing the work, right? Yeah. yeah. So I like, and I also really um, just needed some catharsis. One of the last historical book that I wrote was um, called An Unconditional Freedom, and it was very difficult to write. Mm. It was kind of inspired a bit by Solomon Northrup. Um, it's in mm. my Loyal League series, which features uh, Civil War spies and a, a group called the Loyal League based on real Loyal Leagues that were um, African-Americans, both free and enslaved, who you know, worked to get information to get to the Union and to help mm. take down the Confederacy. And in the last book, the hero is a man who was free um, and he wanted to be a lawyer. And then he gets kind of kidnapped into slavery and like really traumatized. And uh, the book is about him going on a road trip to kill Jefferson Davis. Um, which, you know, I, at the end, he couldn't do that um, mm. because that would be changing history. So, mm, yeah. <laughs> but this time, I was like, and it was just like a particular kind of frustration of like, 
I don't need to do it to make a good ending for the book, but also being like, I can't change history like that. And I was like, okay, so writing in this contemporary thing, I would like, I had a bit more control. And also I just felt like there was a kind of catharsis that was needed by me and probably by other readers. And uh, and by Sydney too. I mean, by, by I think there was a catharsis for Sydney as well, and for the characters. Yeah. You know, like yeah, it's yeah. and and, and even as for Theo too. And for Theo, I mean, it was it's a very violent ending. It actually reminded me kind of 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 the ending of Get Out. Like it is extremely violent and it's very sudden too. Um, but I was like, yeah, I mean, that's kind of how I needed this to end, you know, as a reader and as a person who like started to care about these characters, I was like, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm good. (laughs) I'm good with that. Um, we're going to take a little bit of a break here from our conversation, um, so that I can talk to you about, talk to our audience about ways that we that we all can continue to support GBH um, efforts, um, not only beyond the page, but all of the virtual events that we continue to provide. Um, So there's something special about a community of people who are brought together by a book like this community here with us um, on this Zoom tonight. So if you enjoyed Beyond the Page events like this one, um, I would ask you to please consider making a donation to GBH. If you, maybe you're already a GBH sustainer. If so, we're so grateful for that because sustainers serve as a steady and reliable ongoing source of support for GBH, allowing us to continue to bring you the news and programming on air and online. I'm sure that you're watching or listening to GBH all year round, right? So why not spread your support to um, touch GBH and reach GBH throughout the year? If you're able to give $5 a month as a GBH sustaining member or $60 all at once, um, we will gift you with a hardcover copy of The First to Lie by Hank Philippi Ryan, um, which I believe is our book for next month. Um, Or we also have a limited amount of autographed paperback copies of Alyssa Cole's um, work or her other work, A Duke by Default as well. Um, So if you would like one of those, you can you can um, become a sustaining member for $5 a month or $60 all at once. Now there's two ways for you to give. You can visit wgbh.org slash support events, or you can text GBH to 800-204-3811 to make a donation. Once again, that is text GBH to 800 204 3811 and all of that information is also in the chat for you. Please give $5 a month as a GBH sustainer or $60 all at once, whatever works for you and whatever works for your budget. It's easy, just go to wgbh.org slash support events, click on that link in the chat and contribute whatever you can. You can shower yourself with many great books in September and continue to support GBH. It's a win-win for everybody. Um, And to those of you who are already supporting and sustaining members, we extend our gratitude. Um, I'd like to welcome Alyssa Cole back up here with me and allow us to continue our discussion here. Um, Alyssa, let me check and see what is the top question in our chat right now. Um, Did you, so Carol Griffin is asking, did you write the Sydney and Theo stories at the same time or did you write all of one and then all of another and go back and weave the two together? Um, I wrote them at the same time, alternating back and forth. Um, And then when I went back and was editing at some points, I was like, okay, Theo's starting to sound a bit like Sydney, which a little (laughs) bit, a little bit of that was um, intentional because his personality is conforming to whoever Mm. he's trying to be you know in a relationship or yeah. close to um but the, at some point i was like he just, he shouldn't sound like an actual black woman <laughs> <laughs> not that much in, not that much chapters. <laughs> so it was like you know going back and editing and trying to make sure that their voices came through clearly um and specifically in each chapter And you also, um, this book also got an award. I'm trying to find the name of the award. 
um, an Audi Award um, for the Audible book. Is that right? Yes. It got so an Audi. I, go ahead. I know you go. I was just gonna say that I listened to the book as well as reading it. That's the best way for me to um, experience words is by listening and reading at the same time. I'm curious, like how, how does that process work as you're developing an audiobook? Um, the actors that picked it, I really liked their voices, but how, how did that work to select them? Um, actually, the publisher had like a short list. Um, my editor sent me a short list of like five people, five possible actors for each character. Mm. And for this one, when I listened, when I heard uh, Jay and Susan's voice, I was like, okay, yeah, this is them. It's them. <laughs> It sounds like them. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, we have Teresa, a wonderful name, in the chat asking, who are some of your favorite authors um, or authors who inspire you? Um, some of my favorite authors are um, Beverly Jenkins, who is a romance writer, but she writes um, historical romance set in the U.S. with primarily Black characters, and it's just that you learn so I mean the books are great and romantic and fun um, but also great history lessons so if you enjoy the history aspect of this book you would probably enjoy Beverly Jenkins books as well um, like so often if I'm like seeing something like oh I learned that <laughs> Beverly Jenkins book I definitely didn't learn it in school um, she writes a lot about people um, like um, in California and in the Midwest and Colorado and places like that and set during like from the Civil War to like 1870s or something. Mm. So books covering that time period. Wow. Um, and also um, Courtney Milan, who writes historical romance uh, set in England, but mm. diverse, um, fun and romantic and also, you know, really cool, interesting historical concepts. Nice. Um, also, Nalini Singh, uh, who writes, she writes all kinds of things. She writes contemporary romance, uh, paranormal romance that is actually like kind of paranormal slash sci-fi romance with the Ooh. side change. The Side Changeling Trinity and Side Changeling and Side Changeling Trinity are my favorite series from her. Um, and she also writes thrillers now, too. Um, oh, wow. And her first thriller was A Madness of Sunshine. She's from New Zealand. Mm. Uh, and so, yeah, I really love her work, too. And uh, there's so many good things. But I'll stop with this. That's awesome. That's a great list. That's a great list. Um, we have your website shared um, in the chat as well. Um, so it's a new can... it's a new website. So if you can see it today, it just got put up today. Uh, there was a, a a gremlin in the works, and I was like, oh my god, why did this happen today? Um, but it should be working. We're getting early access. Very excited yes. to see your newly published website. Um, we have B Dauber in the Q and A asking if there is a sequel coming um, to this book. Um, at the moment, there isn't a sequel coming. I did leave it open um, to the possibility of a sequel, in part because like you can't just be like, gentrification is over, the end. Dun -dum, dun -dum, dun -dum. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but in case, you know, we wanted to go back and visit check in with them and see what they were doing in their their fight against these corporations yeah yeah I would be very curious to kind of see what moves forward because I was like well this one plant or hospital or whatever you mm -hmm. want to call it this got shot shut down but like this isn't it you know like this exactly. is this is just one cog in the machine you know like what what about the rest of that machine and also what's the consequence you know like i was just like i don't i don't know but i can't see a whole lot of like powerful wealthy people having this building set on fire and they're not gonna like come over here and fuck some shit up like what 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 happens next you know yeah. i would i would be very curious for that definitely um, we have Zahara in the chat saying, Ms. Cole, very formal. Um, thank you so much for being so generous with your time. You mentioned having a branching thought process and Zahara says that they appreciate you putting to words 
what I feel like may be my own nonlinear tangential way of making connections. Um, and Zahara is wondering if you can talk more about what your process is and maybe also talk about how much time it took for you to complete this particular story. Um, so I'm glad that could be helpful to you. I will add that I have ADHD uh, or I am neurodivergent, which is part, you know, probably related to that branching thought mm -hmm. process. Mm -hmm. So that's something to look into if you haven't. Um, but uh, so for me, like my process actually is very, you know, in part dis disorganized because of that, unfortunately. Um, like I don't write every day. I don't sit down and write every day. I mean, I sit down every day. I don't write every day. Um, mm -hmm. I try to, but it just doesn't always happen. Um, and I generally, it's like sometimes feast or famine. It's always feast or famine. It's like, okay, I'll focus on these other things, at administrative stuff, um, research, um, and research, you know, going down into rabbit holes and, you know, thinking about what I want the story to be about, but then also as I'm researching, um, you know, a lot of it is looking for books that are on that topic, um, mm. then looking in the bibliography of those books. Oh, um, yeah, that's really and, smart. And see, you know, looking up articles, if there are articles available online, and um, I don't have access to JSTOR, but if you have access to JSTOR, finding those kind of articles or on Google Scholar or um things that are available online and kind of just seeing something and then seeing how far you can go down the rabbit hole and what whether it's giving you anything or and then branching seeing what else is there um and kind of for me kind of i try to keep it all together and you know for di different people organized in different ways. For sure. this book, I was uh, very unorganized and I just had, <laughs> I just had like a tab with like hundred, oh, no. window of hundreds, <laughs> hundreds of tabs. Uh, because, you know, I, I basically had so much information already kind of building the framework from all the research I had done for years before and you mm. know, having spent most of my life in New York. And then knowing what I really kind of knew what I wanted the story to do. Um, mm -hmm. So for this one, it actually did not take that long to write um, because I it took a long time to research. Um, yeah. And so for me, a lot of my writing is uh, researching, thinking things over in my head trying to find the right I guess like groove and then once I get in the groove it is like it's on <laughs> then you're writing it I was curious about that if you were like I'm imagining all these tabs open also deep solidarity with that very grateful that Google Chrome just like brings it back up when it doesn't yeah. help the update um but I was wondering if you are doing you do all the research and then you start writing or if it's like you're doing research and you write some and you're like, oh, I need something else and you do more research. Like, is it is it a woven process or is it like one, um, I know I'm ready and then you start? It's semi-woven. Like I do a lot of research beforehand that's kind of like building the foundation. And then as I'm going, it's sometimes like, oh, okay, I need another, <laughs> need mm -hmm. a little thing. I need more about there. this, yeah. yeah. And I think related to the research, we have a couple of questions in the Q&A one about um, that, if, if there's any like writing advice or best practices that are helpful for you, um, that you give to other people that you also take for yourself, that might be related to the research process. And then the another question that's coming up in the Q&A is if you have experience handling weapons or how did you go about researching what it was like to hold them and use them? Um, so I'll start with that first. <laughs> I have, there is a shooting range in New York City on 22nd Street, and um, I went there a few times just mm -hmm. for fun to see what it was like. Um, I enjoyed it, but also was very scared of guns, so I was like, I don't really want to come back, <laughs> to come back here and be around these guns. Um, so I, it was something I did years ago, but that has actually been very useful for writing because mm. actually knowing, you know, what it feels like um, to shoot it and also kind of the gravity of it, because for yeah. me, that was like one reason why I really 
like, okay, I, I understand that there it's fun shooting the target. Um, but then like looking around and seeing everyone, mostly cops, it seemed like shooting, you know, doing their target practice. Mm -hmm. and, um, it was just like a bit weird. It's like, I'm doing this for fun. Why are these other people doing this? I'm not sure mm. everyone is here just for fun. Um, and also, maybe they're all researching their novels, just everyone. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, that because it was like, because of in Manhattan, it was like, there would be like girls nights out groups. And then like, mm. you know, cops. <laughs> they, they that is cops. so interesting. <laughs> I bet that Kim went to girls night out groups to shoot. <laughs> that, that seems like a thing that Kim and her girls definitely did. You know what? <laughs> <laughs> probably that's the um, vibe um, uh, we I, have, oh go ahead oh no and I just wanted to just say that for the best practices for writing my main thing is um finish the book or whatever you're writing mm. um don't get hung up on it being perfect because you're gonna have to rewrite it multiple times um and I think that's the biggest thing that stops so many people it's like they're writing and they are reading what they wrote and they're like this is garbage and it's like often it's not garbage but even if it is garbage you have to go through that see it it's, through yeah, yeah you have you have to finish with the garbage because not for everyone has uh, and this is a, another thing everyone has a different writing style so mm. find out what works for you you don't necessarily have to do what other people are doing advice i think a lot of advice helps because you can be like okay yeah that seems like how i would work or that seems like something that is useful for me, but just take what's useful for you and don't like try and fit yourself into the template of how someone else works because you know there are people who are very successful and they're like just sit down every day and write and that's what you yeah. have to do. But that's how their brain works. Other people's right. brains work in different ways and it's you know just not that's not going to work for them and it's just going to make them feel like they're not writing correctly when mm -hmm. there's actually no correct way. The only correct way is when you're done. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> is, is, is finishing the book and then no matter how you write it you're going to have to go back and rewrite it and revise it yeah. and edit it so like just having giving yourself some don't be not don't be hard on yourself don't compare yourself to other people um that's another thing like literally no one else is the same as you mm -hmm. um no one else <laughs> can write what you write you cannot mm -hmm. write what someone else writes and like comparison is literally just upsetting yourself for no reason yeah yeah <laughs> that's fantastic advice essentially like be the writer who you are and yeah. finish the book that's that's great advice thank you for that um we have a couple of people asking questions about the two narrator um approach. Um, so we have a few people wondering if that's an approach that you use in your other books as well. Um, and then also um, Aaron Porter is asking, um, why did you choose to include Theo instead of just allowing it to be Sydney's perspective? Um, and then also, how did you go about choosing it to be specifically Sydney and Theo and not any of the other characters? Um. So I, I, in romance, I often use dual perspective. I do sometimes write single perspective, but um, I generally like seeing two sides of the story unless there is like a specific reason not to show other sides of the story. Um, mm -hmm. And that, you know, again, that's semi-related to what I was saying about writing, which is everyone thinks differently. Yeah. Um, and for me, there's just like, I know it seems trite, but there literally is always a different version of the of what's going on to people, you know, the Rashomon effect to people <laughs> will tell you the same story in a different way. So um, I feel like it can provide a more complete picture. Mm -hmm. um, and in this story, particularly, um, Sydney's story was telling one specific perspective of someone who grew up in that neighborhood and right. is emotionally attached to the devastation, to, to the gentrification and to what's happening. And right. Theo's story is someone who does not have a home, who is looking for a home, mm -hmm. who thinks possibly this neighborhood and maybe this woman. Okay. And uh, of course, it, this is like romance, but not romance, because this is literally one week of yeah. two, two 
not stable people <laughs> in, a, in a precarious maybe situation. not at the best time of their lives yeah. but you know we've yeah. been there we've all been and, there <laughs> and they deserve love too they deserve to, yeah. to get it on too so <laughs> they're like in this precarious situation and maybe it can maybe you know it's going to work out maybe it won't um that's for the the reader to decide what they think will happen but in that moment they were the people that the other one needed yeah. um to get through this difficult yeah thing. i'll i'll say as as i was reading the book i guess this is a bit of a spoiler it comes pretty close to the end um but the scene where uh sydney is over at theo's house and she sees the iPad and like those messages come up. Um, and then she goes back over to her place and then he calls her. Seeing that scene from like both directions, you know, like kind of over, like seeing the same thing happen more than once in both directions just really, really worked for me. I mean, I think having the two narrators make sense um, in a romance, like you were saying, like it's, it's a, romance so much of it happens in our own heads and so yeah. to get that from both both heads the, the perspective of both heads is so important but that scene in particular just really worked uh and even at that moment I was like I've been reading Theo's thoughts this whole time I know I can trust him but maybe there was a double meaning in everything that he said I was like I don't know I don't know I'm, supposed to believe. I'm so scared I'm so scared I don't know who I should believe like I was fully in there with Sydney I was like I don't know Sydney maybe we should run like I don't know girl this <laughs> maybe you're right I don't know that was some weird messages I don't know <laughs> I really lost my trust with you in that moment I was real scared <laughs> yeah that scene just really worked for me is what I'm saying. Um, so Alyssa, this has been a delight. Um, I wanna end with um, a final question that um, a lot of folks have been voting up in um, the Q&A and that comes from Marge who's saying, I have a sick feeling that this book captures all too common practices. Am I right? Yes, and honestly, so I finished writing this book in the beginning of, no, the end of 2019. Mm -hmm. The first draft was finished in like September of 2019, I think. Mm -hmm. And like the, uh, you know, I edited, I had edits, but like I didn't substantially change things during the edits. And then as the galleys were going out and stuff, it came on September of 2020, like, and the lead up to it was like the worst PR campaign ever. <laughs> it was like literally, yeah. you know, all of these terrible things happening yeah. um the reckoning with white supremacy and um you know police brutality and one of the you know most sickening things for me was you know seeing the brianna taylor situation mm -hmm. and then seeing an article that said that it was linked to gentrification that mm -hmm. her neighborhood was a historically black neighborhood that ha was being targeted because of gentrification and that's why police officers were serving these war like you know unsubstantiated warrants because they were really just trying to get people out of the neighborhood you know by any yeah. means they could and yeah. I was just it was like one of those things where like I wrote the book and obviously was kind of drawing from all of these you know historical things and current things but not even as I still was shocked by so many of the things that were going on because it was like for many of the things I was like this is like has a basis in reality um but it's fiction right and like everything in the book was happening in real life and I was like this is right. just really freaky. yeah I mean <laughs> and, and like like you said earlier you know that sure there could be a sequel there could probably be dozens of sequels yeah. because this really doesn't end you know it's yeah. there it, there really is there is no end to this um and I want to acknowledge that for me part of the reason the ending was so justified um was because gentrification is violent um and so if if the consequence of committing violence is violence like I, I wouldn't say that I'm always always a fan of that, but in a book, like it, it was extremely cathartic to experience it. Absolutely. And I'm I do so, want to add. I yeah. just want to add really quickly that one yes. of the things I thought about was like movies like 
falling down and kind of the the white male you know anti-hero who has something happen that's like bad but not like go off and become an anti-hero and like kill people and do all kinds of things mm -hmm. and I didn't want to write an anti-hero I want to try someone who was sympathetic because bad things were actually happening to them but then I was like I feel like in these kinds of stories it's just like bad things happen to us and then we persevere yeah uh, yeah and we don't get to have the same emotional you know overwhelm and freak out that uh, people can you know in pop culture it right. can be like just someone had a bad day mm -hmm. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so it was mm -hmm. like that was another reason why i decided to just fully go for it because i was just like you know from everything that has happened in the story her reaction is completely normal <laughs> like it would be yeah. abnormal to not react that way completely given completely. everything that's led up to the ending in the book Absolutely. i'm not you know, I, you know i'm not telling people to go out and commit acts of violence but like in the book there was a particular chain of events that i felt made the ending surprising but also like okay i see why <laughs> i see right. why she did that right yeah yeah and books aren't books aren't real life i mean the ending is yeah. isn't real life um but what's happening in the book um is extremely real it's extremely real it's it's extremely present like it is happening in present tense um and uh yeah and extremely extremely common i'm so grateful for this conversation i'm grateful to be able to chat with you this evening i'm grateful to our audience for their questions i of course apologize as we knew we wouldn't get to all of the questions and of course we didn't but i'm really glad that you wrote this book um i'm glad that you shared these words and these thoughts with the world um and really delighted and honored that i was able to speak with you today Thank you so much. It was a great conversation. And I do just want to say that, you know, I said I don't want people to go out and do like the end of the book, but that's not entirely true. The very end of the book where people are starting to link up and point out like this is happening here, this is happening here. Okay, yes. what are we going to do about it? That is what I think people can do in real life to kind of absolutely deal with absolutely. That's the ending that we're all striving for. Um, well, again, thank you everyone so much for tuning in with us this month in the Beyond the Page Book Club. And Alyssa, thank you so, so much for joining us this evening um, and for your candor and your conversation. Um, so if you are joining us uh, we invite you to join us over the coming weeks as we take a dive into our September selection. As I mentioned earlier, we're going to be reading The First to Lie with Hank Philippi Ryan. Um, don't forget that if you become a sustainer today, you can actually get next month's book autographed by Hank Philippi Ryan and shipped directly to your door. Um, the virtual conversation for that book will take place on Wednesday, September 22nd at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, and don't forget to also join our Beyond the Book, Beyond the Page Facebook group, which I mentioned earlier, where we have like questions about the book as it's going. It's a, it's a conversation to get that book group vibe. Um, so join us on Facebook there. Once again, thank you so much, everybody, for being here this evening, and happy reading. Have a great evening. Bye now.